Hello, and welcome to the 190th meeting of AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I'm Gilda Barabino, chair of the AAAS Board of Directors. It's a pleasure to see you all here in the beautiful Mile High City. Welcome. I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we are convening is the traditional territory of the Ute, Shenye, and Arapaho peoples. We also recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. Before we begin the program, I would like to recognize the members of the American Junior Academy of Sciences. AJAS is the only National Honor Society recognizing America's high school students for outstanding scientific research. The winners of statewide competitions are nominated to represent their states at the National AJS Convention, which is held in conjunction with our annual meeting. I hope that you will take the time to meet and encourage these young scholars. At this time, I'd like to ask the AJAS students to stand and be recognized. AAAS is committed to providing a safe and productive meeting environment that fosters open dialogue and the exchange of scientific ideas, promotes equal opportunities and treatment of all, for all participants, and is free of harassment and discrimination. Simply put, harassment of any kind has no place at this or any scientific gathering, and we will not tolerate it. By registering for this meeting, you agree to abide by AAAS's meeting code of conduct, and it's available at our meetings.aaas.org slash policies. Further, while we encourage vigorous dialogue, debate, and even disagreement, our code of conduct requires a safe and inclusive environment for all attendees, speakers, staff, and participants. We have endeavored to provide safe spaces for controversial discussions to unfold, particularly in the Expo. However, any disruption to meeting programming will be handled in accordance with the meeting code of conduct. Let's join together as a community and commit to no one being made to feel out of place, unwelcome, or harassed at this meeting for who they are, where they come from, or what they believe. I want to pause a moment to say how wonderful it is to see so many new and familiar faces in the audience. Being together over the next several days is a unique and unparalleled opportunity. We hope that each of you makes the most of your time to reconnect with existing friends and colleagues, make connections with new ones, and discover the promise of interdisciplinary collaboration for advancing the scientific endeavor and our collective humanity. It is a tremendous honor to introduce one of our special guests this evening, an honorary co-chair of the 2024 AAAS Annual Meeting, the 46th governor of the state of Colorado, Jared Polis. Governor Polis is an entrepreneur, education leader, and public servant. After launching several successful companies, including one out of his college dorm room, Governor Polis committed himself to make sure that other Coloradans had the opportunity to pursue their dreams. Governor Polis founded schools for at-risk students and new immigrants and he started nonprofit organizations to help veterans and entrepreneurs. Prior to his election, 
as governor in 2018, Polis served as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, serving alongside AAAS CEO Emeritus Rush Holt. Polis represented the second congressional district of Colorado from 2009 to 2019. Prior to serving in Congress, Polis was an elected member of the Colorado State Board of Education for six years. Now, in his second term as governor, Polis has focused on saving Coloradans money, keeping the state's economy strong, and preserving the Colorado way of life. Governor Polis has instituted universal free full day kindergarten, signed a number of bills to save families money on health care, and made significant progress towards the state's goal of 100% renewable energy by 2040. His administration has also made historic investments in affordable housing and transportation infrastructure. His efforts to expand health care access to medically underserved communities and to ensure that equity and justice remain central to building a Colorado for all have produced impactful legislation and made progress toward his administration's bold vision. We are so delighted that he has taken time out of his incredibly busy schedule to personally welcome us to Denver and to Colorado. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Governor Jared Polis. You know, Gilda just, I didn't realize until she the introduction that I, I guess I'm the honorary chair of this event, so I should have brought my gavel. I apologize. I do have a nice joke to open with. A biologist, a chemist, and a statistician are out hunting in Colorado. The biologist shoots at a deer, misses to the left. The chemist takes a shot and misses to the right. Uh, and the statistician yells, we got him. Uh, thank you, Chair Gilda Barabino. Thank you, President Yamamoto. Uh, AAAS President-elect Willie May, uh, AAA, uh, AAAS CEO Sudip uh, Parikh, uh, and members of the Board of Directors, all of you, welcome to the great state of Colorado. Uh, we are so appreciative of having you here. There really is no better place to come together to celebrate the power of science and innovation to shape our lives and our future. Uh, in our state, we pride ourselves on innovation, on being on the cutting edge, whether that's climate research or energy or aerospace or tech or quantum computing. Uh, our skilled workforce, our world-class institutions of higher education, our federal labs uh, create the perfect ecosystem for the STEM fields to thrive. Um, I'm not a scientist myself, I apologize, but my father is, has a PhD in physics, uh, and that's actually the reason that I'm in uh, Colorado uh, after Getting his PhD in 1970, uh, he got a job at NOAA in Colorado, uh, where I was born a few years later. So I owe my own presence in Colorado to scientists and science and the federal labs, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, we know uh, we are focused on uh, making sure that we can create the talent in science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM fields. Uh, to propel uh, the future of science across our country. Uh, and gatherings like this are so important to really share innovation and progress, hopefully also to talk about some of the policy considerations that are so important about making sure that uh, science informs policy. Uh, we are proud in Colorado and we are to turn to science to help uh, make sure that we can move our state forward when we look at the data surrounding the importance of early childhood education. We rolled up our sleeves and made sure that we got universal preschool done for every four-year-old in the state, which leads to better learning outcomes. Uh, just earlier this week, we announced the funding plan to upgrade our work around preparing the next generation of healthcare workers and professionals, including establishing the third medical school in Colorado at University of Colorado Greeley. Uh, where we hope in a few years to be able to graduate an additional 150 MDs a year 
uh, along with the nurses, nurse practitioners, EMTs, and the whole continuum of care uh, that we want to make sure that we are ready to do. We're also prioritizing science education and enrichment for our kindergarten through 12th grade students. One thing we did recently is we looked at, as you know, the entire nation, and of course Colorado is no exception, saw a decrease in student achievement in science and English and math uh, during the years that were interrupted by the COVID pandemic. But we were able to find, and we did this for math as well, but for science we found 16 schools across Colorado that had significant increases in science achievement despite the interruptions. One of the two years was, was interrupted for some of them, uh, part of the second year was. But despite that, we found 16 schools, including many schools that serve low-income Coloradans, that increased science achievement by two bars on our state rating system. And uh, what we decided to do is we used some federal funds to uh, give them an award, $50,000, uh, for their discretion of the site principal, but a Governor's Bright Spot Award, but also just as importantly to learn from them to say, what is it that you were doing that other schools should be doing to improve science achievement during a very difficult period? Uh, when it went down across the nation, how did you increase two bars? And uh, we learned a lot about that, and we are now focused on ensuring more access to after-school science, enrichment in education, and access to some of the very best uh, curriculum and resources for teachers uh, and principals across the state, because we want these examples of success to be universal uh, rather than to be isolated examples of, of excellence. So we're working to expand science-based after-school enrichment, uh, making sure that every child in our state has the opportunity to learn about the wonders of science from a young age. And I want to thank AAAS for being such a good partner on the policy side. Some of you may not know, but during the convening last year of the National Governors Association that I'm honored to serve as vice chair of, we'll be going to Washington, D.C. Uh, next week. But last year, uh, we gained valuable insight from a AAAS uh, convened seminar around uh, PFAS and, and other environmental contaminants that are key to our future understanding of evolving issues and risks, an issue that's being dealt with, of course, at the federal level as well uh, as at the state level here in Colorado and many other states. The future of science is bright thanks to the work and advocacy and collaboration that you do. On behalf of the state of Colorado, I want to welcome you to our state especially ahead of a three-day weekend where I hope many of you get to the slopes and get to try out some skiing or boarding. Uh, we're expecting some snow Friday and Saturday, so uh, we prepared that for you, and uh, we should be ready to go. Uh, and I hope that you do get to enjoy, of course, if you do make it to the mountains, but also the cultural amenities of the city of Denver that you're in, as well as everything else that our state has to offer. Um, we're excited uh, to be a science-forward state to make sure that we center the role of science in driving innovation and progress. I, on behalf of the state of Colorado, welcome you to our state and wish you a very successful convening. Thank you. So thank you so much, Governor Polis. We are so pleased to be here in Colorado, and we are appreciative of, Dr. of Governor Polis's decades-long support for science and technology. We are gathering here thanks to the support of all of you, along with a coalition of wonderful sponsors and partners. I'd like to take a moment to recognize some of them from the podium tonight. Arizona State University, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, CURE, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the University of Colorado Boulder, the Georgia Tech School of Public Policy, Florida International University, the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Science, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, IBM, Smart Simple Software, the George Washington University, Fulbright, the University of Chicago Press, and Cambridge University Press. Our deepest thanks to these organizations for their generous support 
of this year's annual meeting. And now I'm pleased to announce the winners of the 2024 AAAS Awards and Prizes. This year's impressive slate of winners will be honored at a ceremony here tomorrow morning. So in advance, please join me in congratulating Catherine Hayhoe, winner of the AAAS Manny L. Baumick Award for Public Engagement with Science. Joel Premack, winner of the AAAS Philip Haig Abelson Prize. Tarek Abu Hamed, winner of the AAAS David and Betty Hamburg Award for Science Diplomacy. Eric Stover, winner of the AAAS Award for Scientific Freedom and Responsibility. <laughs> Luis Colon, winner of the AAAS Lifetime Mentor Award. <laughs> Ana Maria Porras, winner of the AAAS Early Career Award for Public Engagement with Science. And the research article entitled, Early Dispersal of Domestic Horses into the Great Plains and Northern Rockies, winner of the 2024 AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize. Let's congratulate all of this year's winners. And before we hear from our AAAS president this evening, we have one more special guest who I am delighted to introduce. Dr. Thomas Check is a distinguished professor of biochemistry at the University of Colorado Boulder and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. A native of Iowa, Tom completed his undergraduate studies in chemistry at Grinnell College and went on to complete his PhD in chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley he completed a postdoctoral fellowship at MIT. In 1978, he joined the faculty of the University of Colorado Boulder, where he became a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator in 1988 and distinguished professor of chemistry and biochemistry in 1990. In 1982, Dr. Check and his research group announced that an RNA molecule the tetrahymena, a single-celled bond organism, cut and rejoined chemical bonds in the complete absence of proteins. Thus, RNA was not restricted to being a passive carrier of genetic information, but could have an active role in cellular metabolism. This discovery of self-splicing RNA provided the first exception to the long-held belief that biological reactions are always catalyzed by proteins. In addition, it has been heralded as providing a new plausible scenario for the origin of life. Because RNA can be both an information carrying molecule and a catalyst, perhaps the first self-producing system consisted of RNA alone. It was this discovery that led to Tom receiving the 1989 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. From 2000 to 2009, Tom served as president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which is the nation's largest private funder of biomedical research. In 2009, he returned to full-time research and teaching at Colorado, the University of Colorado Boulder, where he served as director of the BioFrontiers Institute until 2020. Tom's work has been recognized by many national and international awards and prizes, including the Heineken Prize of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences, the Albert Lasker Basic Medical Research Award, and the National Medal of Science. 
Tom is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he is a fellow of AAAS. Please join me in welcoming Tom Check. Well, thank you, Gilda, for that very nice introduction. And thank you, AAAS, for holding this special meeting uh, here in Denver. Special thanks for choosing CU Boulder as your local host institution, which is what I'm representing today. Certainly this year's theme, which is science without walls, resonates very strongly with us. Uh, and although there are many walls that we need to deconstruct in science, I have five minutes, so I'll just talk about one of them. And that's the walled off disciplines, the traditional Department of Chemistry, Physics, Biology, Engineering departments that serve the universities so well as a way of organizing their teaching and their research in the last century, but we find now is more and more inhibiting solving problems where the solution requires multiple expertise. At CU Boulder, as in many of your universities, we've created interdisciplinary institutes that bring together scientists from multiple departments. So the kind of question, the kind of attitude we have is, you know, we have a question to ask, we have a problem to solve, we need you and you and you and the fact that you are in different departments is a good thing, and we just want to all come together and solve these problems. So we have a dozen of these institutes at CU Boulder. Just to mention a couple, JILA, uh, which is a collaboration with NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is a home for physicists and chemists, and they even tackle biochemical problems sometimes, such as using atomic force microscopy or molecular tweezers to probe the energetics of uh, macromolecules and their interactions. Uh, they've garnered four locally grown Nobel Prizes in physics so far in this century. Another institute, Ceres, the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Scientists, Sciences, brings together biologists, chemists, geoscientists, engineers, and again, a federal agency, NOAA. And then there's BioFrontiers Institute. So this is personal to me, so I'm going to step back just for a second and tell a little bit of my own story. So in the year 2000, as Gilda mentioned in her introduction, I moved to the D.C. area as president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And one of our projects during that de the decade that I was there was to build the Genelia Research Campus of the Institute, its first uh, freestanding research institute. And the farmer from whom we bought the land had two daughters. One was named Jane and the other was Cornelia. And so he sort of made a, gene a hybrid, sort of a genetic hybrid of the names and called it Genelia Farm. And when we bought the land, we decided to keep the name because we knew that we had no idea what would be happening there in 100 years. So we didn't want to choose a name that would go out of date. But we did know what we wanted to do at the beginning. And this was to bring together neuroscientists, physicists who were experts at imaging, and computer scientists to understand how the brain was wired in order to accomplish complex behavior and memory. And this turned out to be really successful. Uh, of the 15 people we hired, one got the Nobel Prize in Physics within 10 years for uh, discovering super resolution microscopy, and the Institute also became a magnet for international conferences and collaborations uh, really around the world. So when I returned to Boulder in 2009, I wondered if we could build a home for multidisciplinary biosciences at a state university. Certainly we had scant financial resources relative to the Howard Hughes. I would, some of you know about nanotechnology. We had nano resources, okay? But we had great human resources. We had wonderful faculty, undergraduate, 
graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows. And the idea was that many of the most pressing problems in the basic biology and in biomedicine are really best solved by biologists working together with computer scientists, mathematicians, physicists, and engineers. So we were able to assemble an outstanding group of faculty. Many of them had offers to join the faculties of Ivy League universities or the top-ranked institutions in the San Francisco Bay Area, but they were excited to do their work here on the frontier, do frontier research on the frontiers of the Rocky Mountains. And I was the founding director of this Science Without Walls experiment. I realized pretty soon that although the research was going great, we needed to have a companion program to allow our gra some graduate students to, to engage in this same sort of intensely interdisciplinary research. So we started IQ Biology, which stands for Interdisciplinary Quantitative Biology as a PhD program. It's only about 10 students per year, very small compared to the hundreds of graduate students that our partner departments bring into as departmental students. But these are often double majors in math and biology or in computer science and biology from their undergraduate work. And we tell them, you shouldn't choose between these. You need to do both. You need to do both of them deeply. And you need to do a thesis that makes use of uh, more than one discipline. And this turned out to be really challenging to fund this program because the departments all had their own PhD programs. And although they loved our students, they loved getting them, they loved the fact that we were paying for them, they didn't want to contribute anything to the program. And so fortunately, the National Science Foundation came through with some very large education grants and also some philanthropic citizens in the state of Colorado endowed some graduate fellowships, which led to the sustainability of this program. So you can see how this um, science without walls is so dear to me, and I thank you, AAAS, for putting the spotlight on it during this meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. The development of the exceptional multidisciplinary program you will enjoy over the next three days has been guided by AAAS President Keith Yamamoto, who will deliver his presidential address shortly, and the truly dedicated annual meeting program committee that works year round. Thanks to Keith and the committee for their excellent work this year. What an exciting program we have. I would now like to invite Keith Yamamoto to the podium, and I'll give an introduction of him right now. Keith Yamamoto is Vice Chancellor for Science Policy and Strategy and Professor of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology at the University of California, San Francisco. As the first to hold this position, Keith leads efforts to anticipate the needs of an increasingly dynamic biomedical research endeavor and to position UCSF optimally by working within the university as well as influencing and shaping science policy at the state and national levels and beyond. Throughout his career, Keith has been focused on the practice of science, science education and mentoring, peer review, communication of science, and advocacy for federal support for research. He also directs a basic research lab making groundbreaking discoveries focused on signaling and transcriptional regulation by nuclear receptors. After earning his PhD from Princeton University, Keith joined the UCSF faculty in 1976. He has served in several significant leadership roles, including Chair of the Department of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology, Vice Dean for Research in the School of Medicine, and Vice Chancellor for Research. 
He chaired the committee that led the planning of the UCSF Mission Bay Campus. Keith has chaired or served on numerous national committees focusing on a wide range of areas, including public and scientific policy, public understanding and support of biological research, science education, training the biomedical workforce, research funding, and process of peer review at the NIH. He chairs the Coalition for the Life Sciences and sits on both the National Academy of Medicine Executive Committee and the National Academy of Sciences Division of Earth and Life Sciences Advisory Committee. As chair of the NAS Board on Life Sciences, he created the, the study committee that produced Toward Precision Medicine, building a knowledge network for biomedical research and a new taxonomy of disease, the report that enunciated the precision medicine concept. And he has helped lead efforts to implement it at the state and national level, as well as at UCSF. Keith is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Academy of Microbiology. And of course, he is a fellow of AAAS. But more important than any of this, if you see Keith around the meeting, you should ask him to seek pictures of his newest grandberry, grandbaby, <laughs> and also the new puppy. <laughs> So please join me in welcoming and congratulating Keith Yamamoto. I like it. Oh boy, thank you, Gilda. Um, given the theme of the meeting, I think you can see why I was uh, really enthusiastic about trying to recruit Tom Check to uh, be the head, honorary co-chair, uh, to have CU Boulder serve as the local host institution, and to talk a little bit about what he has done to drive the, this goal of Science Without Walls. So uh, thank you, Tom, for, for all that you have done and for your words today. I'm going to start with um, uh, a little bit of kind of near-term science history um, and tell you about a, a book that was written uh, 55 years ago, so it's not that long, not that much history, by a famous molecular biologist, Gunther Stent. Uh, he, he published this, this book with an uplifting title, The Coming of the Golden Age, but then a real ominous subtitle, A View of the End of Progress. He asserted that all foundational scientific discoveries had already been made and that the future would really consist of sort of cleaning up the details. Now, I read that book when it came out with great interest because I was an aspiring molecular biologist in my first year in graduate school. Well, I'm pleased to confirm that this year, as in the previous 55, his predictions were premature at best. There's simply no denying that this is an incredible time to be in this enterprise dubbed STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. Our community is driving breakthrough discoveries and astonishing technologies that have transformed and will continue to transform our thinking, our work, and our lives. We are assuming a central role in addressing societal challenges around the environment and climate, health, uh, energy, and food and water security. And all of it benefiting our economic and national security. So I'm thrilled to gather with you here in Denver under the banner of the largest general scientific association in the world. Each of you has a critical role in the STEM community, a community far larger and richer than the researchers depicted here. 
Think also of a developer, engineer, policymaker, regulator, funder, communicator, or an interested observer and potential consumer of science and technology advances. It's an exciting time to celebrate discoveries, uncover new capabilities, and ponder unsolved or unexpected puzzles at scales from subatomic to universal, from picoseconds to eons, from cells to societies. It's a special honor for me to lead this year's meeting. I want to welcome and thank Gilda Barabino, who led last year's meeting and currently chairs the AAAS Board of Directors for her very generous introduction. Last year, Gilda reminded us that humanity is core to science, that as scientists and engineers, we must embrace our humanity to seek out connections and to participate and contribute to building a better world. So it's not a stretch to say that the theme I chose for this year's meeting, Towards Science Without Walls, is in some ways an extension of Gilda's Science for Humanity theme. But the outstanding program that you will experience over the next few days is a result, as Gilda said, of countless hours of dedicated work by the AAAS Annual Meeting Scientific Program Committee. They're seated here in the front of the room, and I'd like to ask them to stand to be recognized. Stand to be recognized, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> it it's really has been a true joy to collaborate with this team of esteemed scientists and engineers from around the world. Thank you. Many thanks also to our um, uh, scientific session uh, reviewers, poster judges, session aides, and many others who have contributed to making this meeting possible. Also joining us are the AAAS president-elect, Willie E. May, who will take office as AAAS president in the coming weeks. The AAAS CEO, Sudha Parikh, and my fellow members of the AAAS board of directors. It's an honor to serve with all of you in striving to achieve the AAAS vision of a boldly inclusive, mobilized, and global scientific community that ignites, enables, and celebrates scientific, ex scientific excellence and science-informed decisions and actions. I also want to acknowledge three past presidents of AAAS who are with us, Gil Oman, Peggy Hamburg, and Susan Amara. Thank you for being here. There are also several past members of the AAAS board who are with us, Laura Green, Lawrence Hasseltine, David Shaw, and perhaps others that I have not uh, had the opportunity to see. So thank you all for being here, for your continued support and engagement. And finally, I want to thank the several special individuals and groups and thank them for joining us. Uh, Governor Jared Polis, as we said, Governor Mon Mon uh, Dr. Monica Bertagnoli, Director of the U.S. National Institutes of Health, Dr. Asmaret uh, Asifa uh, Berhe, Director of the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Science, and Dr. Patricia Gruber, Science and Technology Advisor for the U.S. Department of State. Also here are delegates, delegations from Canada, from China, the European Union, Japan, Singapore, South Africa, Ukraine, the United Kingdom, and more. Your presence reinforces the importance of hearing from a broad range of perspectives and experiences to explore the challenges of the day. So thank you for taking the time to join us. Okay, so now let's dig in. Look around you and marvel as you traverse the next few days. Make it a point, of course, to connect with your friends in your field, but also with those who participate and contribute in other ways, and with those joining us from around the world. I suspect that we'll share the same first response to all the stunning advances in science and technology, right? It's amazing. You know, what's not to like? Well, while we can certainly make that claim, I'm going to ask you, even as we celebrate, that you join me during this talk and in the course of the rest of the meeting 
to step back and reflect, to ask whether and how we might do even better. So those questions are worth asking, and they're especially worth asking here because you represent the full spectrum of STEM professionals, educators, policymakers, communicators. You are the community that needs to and can answer those questions. So over the next few days, I invite you to take the time to delve deeper and share feedback with me and with each other. The overarching issue I want to consider with you is silos, walls. Walls that fragment our STEM enterprise, barriers that compromise achieving advances with the magnitude, scope, pace, and equitable impact that's needed. So note the first word in the title, toward. It's a vector a sort, and a sort of timekeeper. It says we don't have science without walls, but we're moving in a direction toward science without walls. So I'll highlight four. Walls that inhibit communication and collaboration among science and technology disciplines and across sectors like government, academia, industry, and philanthropy. Remember what Tom Cech was talking about. Walls that tether creativity and imagination. Walls that constrain validated and respected membership in the STEM community. And walls that separate STEM from the rest of society. Historically, these walls were so solid as to become immovable features of our ecosystem, part of the natural order of things, established so early and completely that they became transparent, unrecognized as barriers. So can we even imagine a world completely unencumbered by these restrictions? Thankfully, it's not bleak and hopeless. You heard from Tom already. There is progress, and I'll describe examples of activities that seek at least to perforate some of these walls. However, I contend that focused, all-hands-on-deck acknowledgement and action are needed. My hope is that each of you will return to your home country, sector, institution, lab, office, whatever, and join one of the efforts that I'll describe tonight, or take an action on your own that surmounts, cracks, or breaks down one of these walls. So my first exposure to a scientist's individual action in what I guess could be framed as public outreach, but at its heart was just one scientist's effort to improve science education, came from my PhD thesis advisor, Bruce Alberts. Bruce, as we all know, was an outstanding biochemistry and cell biology researcher, the primary author, author of the remarkable textbook, Molecular Biology of the Cell, president of the National Academy of Sciences, editor-in-chief of science, National Medal of Science awardee, and so on. But to me, Bruce is my lifetime mentor, colleague, and friend. At the time of the story I'll tell, he had just completed his fourth year as an assistant professor at Princeton. And I had just joined his lab as his second graduate student. Now, wait a minute. Fourth year faculty member, two graduate students. You might think that things were not going so well for the guy. But if he felt that way, he didn't act like it and didn't show it. He drove down to Trenton High School and convinced the science teachers there to let him bus their kids up to Princeton for one summer day, one summer day, so he could show them how cool and interesting and fun science is. He then recruited me and some other graduate students and challenged us to design some experiments for the kids to do that would interest and amuse and amaze them while, of course, teaching them about science. Well, everyone had a great time. So Bruce wrote an NSF grant application to fund an expanded program, but his department chair refused to sign off on the grant and advised Bruce that he should get back in his lab and do and publish his experiments if he hoped to get tenure. So what did he do? He persuaded someone in the dean's office to sign off on the grant. 
and proceeded to grow the program. Years later, as a colleague at UCSF, Bruce would launch the Science Education Partnership, a program that now serves 80% of the students in the San Francisco public schools. But that day of science for those Trenton kids had a big effect on me. Bruce taught me by that example and many other things he said and did, that scientists are part of a large enterprise that in many ways has control over its own destiny, or at least influence over its culture, principle, policies, and practices. The implication is that scientists, that is STEM professionals, need to contribute to that enterprise beyond their research projects. Now, given that control or influence is a good starting point, um, it's up to us to ask, you know, how is it that we've ended up with an enterprise that is internally constrained by multiple walls? Well, I guess it's a bit of a relief to say that we didn't plan it that way, but my thinking about this begins with the notion that humans are innate scientists and engineers. Children, those of you who have them, drive their parents nuts with endless questions of how and why. Humans are intensely curious about the world and universe around us, about our place within it, and of course, about ourselves. And we're natural puzzle solvers. In ancient times, a few individuals that we know of, Archimedes, Aristotle, Hippocrates, and those guys, and others that we don't know, derived knowledge with thought and calculation and brilliant insight and pursued it with experimentation. Sometimes they were supported by patrons who shared their curiosity but lacked the insight or drive to address it, but they were mostly working in isolation or maybe with one or a couple of followers. Some looked outward at our planet and beyond, their origins and the natural laws governing them. Others looked inward at our bodies and our minds, comparing ourselves with other life forms. These scientists and thinkers with their varied scholarly activities were brought into proximity with each other with the rise of academia, which collected and supported groups of scholars and surrounded them with students. So the emergence and separation of specialized disciplines and the eventual clustering of specialty areas into departments, like Tom expressed, reflected a natural radiation of different interest areas more than the impulse of bureaucrats to draw org charts. Governments became involved, taking on a substantial patron function. In the United States, the government supported and engaged scientists during World War II, as we all saw in Oppenheimer, and then formalized in Science the Endless Frontier by Vannevar Bush, a federal commitment to support basic knowledge discovery, research, and training in universities, leaving it to the private sector, driven by the profit motive, to develop and apply that knowledge into products that serve the public. So, a government academia philanthropy complex was separated, uncoupled, from the industry sector, and each of them housed multiple disciplines differing by topical foci and experimental approaches, and evolving specialized syntax and nomenclature. And so with time, each domain seemed less and less able to interact with each other or feeling a need to. And the work in one started increasingly to, to appear unrelated to others. Sturdy silo walls blocked off communication and collaboration, reinforced by bureaucratic structures in academia and funding agencies and by the Vannevar Bush mandate. And that mandate, the part about imagining a seamless handoff from government-supported discovery to industry-driven development and application was bumpy at best because the profit motive proved insufficient to induce industry to act, or at least to act quickly. Among the 9,000 known human diseases, there are approved treatments for about 500. 
for many, industry has judged the economic uh, risk of successful development to be too high, or the size or capacity of the near-term market to be too low. And how important is poor communication and interaction between the knowledge discoverers and the technology and developers? Among the 24 most effective drugs on the market, the median time between the key bit of knowledge discovery and F the day of FDA approval of a new drug, 32 years. Thus, the first set of walls that I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks persists and inhibits productive interactions and collaborations across STEM disciplines and across the STEM sectors. I'm pleased to say, though, that there are positive de developments. I'm thinking here of the federal level, of three broad initiatives created by the present administration two of which, the Chips and Science Act and the Executive Order on Advanced Biotechnology and Biomanufacturing Innovation, the mouthful, created specific mechanisms and resources to integrate and coordinate the diverse disciplinary expertise across the two dozen federal STEM departments and agencies, and additionally, envision partnerships and regional technology centers that support and enable the private sector to develop and apply newly discovered knowledge and address urgent societal challenges. The third initiative is ARPA-H, a new federal health agency modeled after DARPA that some of you know of and designed to imagine and achieve bold, impactful goals with urgency. This new agency assembles and funds transdisciplinary, multi-sector partnerships and, team, and teams of scientists and engineers from universities, companies, research institutions, and national labs. These partnerships and teams are devising and applying advanced technologies to tackle critical health challenges and de deliver prototype solutions. Importantly, ARPA-H specifically seeks and rewards participants that embrace urgency, bold and risky approaches with high tolerance of failure, so-called borderless innovation, to rapidly assess feasibility of transformative concepts and to de-risk development. So with hopes for cracks in, uh, in that first wall, let's turn our attention to the second where academia and funding agencies create recognition and reward systems focused on individual achievement and incremental progress at a time when we know that collaborative work and taking on bold ideas are the, are the elements that are going to have real impact. As we all know, scientific progress is built on the prior work of others, and most insights emerge from the synthesis of two or more prior findings, often by others, thought previously to be unrelated. Moreover, as we all know, collaborative teams that combine knowledge, approaches, and technologies from two or more disciplines are frequently more powerful drivers of scientific achievement. So at least in the life sciences, the domain I know best, how frequently a researcher publishes publication in so-called prestige or high-impact journals, and whether they hold the first or last position on the roster of authors, are used as surrogates for quality and impact, and major determinants of academic hiring, promotion, and tenure, and the funding of scientists. Combine these practices with the fact that the high-impact journals extract big fees for aspire, from aspiring authors. And you have a formula for favoring well-resourced researchers at high-powered institutions, publishing lots of consensus, low-risk, low-impact papers, and limiting the sharing of data and resources. What does this mean for how science is conducted? 
frequent low-risk productivity is rewarded even if low impact, whereas failure of any kind, even informative failure, is severely penalized. That innate paradigm-busting, major discovery or problem-solving scientist in us is repressed. Mentors counsel trainees, and colleagues counsel each other throughout entire careers to stay in lane, to propose work that is low risk, highly feasible, and to avoid anything that sniffs of failure. We are pressed to do what Nobel laureate molecular biologist Francois Jacob called day science, instead of the night science we want to do. To quote Jacob, day science calls into play arguments that mesh like gears, results that have the force of certainty, conscious of its progress, proud of its past, sure of its future, day science advances in light and glory. By contrast, he continued, night science wanders blind. It hesitates, stumbles, recoils, sweats, wakes with a start, sounds like my life, <laughs> doubting everything it is forever trying to find itself question itself, pull itself back together. Night science is a sort of workshop of the possible where what will become the building blocks and building material of science is worked out. Putting fissures into this second wall is a substantial challenge. The conservative standards set in academia have been in place for many decades, and peer review of grant applications for all its merits, and there are many, is a conservative process. It's hardly surprising that grant reviewers like applications that use the same methods that they do back at home in their labs and don't stray from the prevailing paradigms of the day that the reviewers may have helped to establish. However, multiple groups such as i incentivizing collaborative and open research a National Academies Roundtable aligning incentives for open science, and Helios, Higher Education Leadership Initiative for Open Science, are working along multiple fronts, including conversations about reassessing and revising the recognition and reward metrics from academia. And ARPA-H, as we heard, as well as Welcome Leap, a UK-based philanthropy, are actively inviting bold and risky ideas that may fail, but if successful, would be transformative. Importantly, we know that relieving scientists of false metrics for advancement and funding and encouraging open, collaborative research would not only be welcomed by science, scientists, but would also unleash them to make impactful discoveries and breakthrough applications. How do we know that? Because it happened during the pandemic when scientists were forced to shut down their research programs except for the few who changed course, who pivoted their direction, attention, and intention to start working on SARS-CoV-2 virus or the COVID disease itself. During that time, that subset of, of the research ecosystem underwent an amazing change. Two great examples that I happen to know about were launched in 2020 at UCSF. I'll tell you about one of them, created by Nevin Krogan. He sought not only to break silos, but to build bridges, and he has. A remarkable, transdisciplinary, transsector, international consortium of scientists and engineers in joyful collaboration, and they are still doing important, high-impact work today. This consortium launched in March 2020 with 10 UCSF labs that, that um, Nevin convinced to work together on SARS-CoV-2 biology, COVID-19 pathology, and identification of therapies. That effort quickly grew. Now, there are 113 labs at 44 institutions in 12 countries with more than 1,000 researchers who love working together. 
The consortium started or is collaborating with 13 companies, has published over 50 papers, each with massively shared authorship, commonly with women and early stage investigators in the key authorship positions. All of the papers posted in an open access repository. Oh, and they've gotten results. They've uh, uh, distributed reagents and resources to over 400 labs worldwide unconditionally. 332 cellular proteins have been identified that interact with the SARS-CoV-2 proteins, yielding a fundamental new understanding of infection and transmission. And 26 drugs are in clinical trials, including one that is now in phase three. We've got to celebrate and sustain these types of emergent practices, highlighting to our academic and funding agency leaders that encouraging and rewarding collaborative team research, displacing careerism by reigniting and rewarding the drive for discovery and impact, and establishing and enabling durable partnerships across disciplines, sectors, and national boundaries enliven and excite our investigators and can, and can um, really inspire remarkable scientific advances. The third category of walls that I want to consider are those that constrain validated and respected membership in the STEM community due to bias, institutional hierarchies, or inequitable access to resources. A study published in 2011 revealed that NIH grant ap applications from black scientists were funded at a substantially lower rate than their white counterparts or those from other racial minorities. 13 years later, that disparity has not yet re been resolved. Another study published in 2020 revealed what was termed the diversity innovation paradox. Data from 1.2 million PhD recipients and their dissertations across three decades revealed a higher rate of innovation among PhD students from underrepresented genders and demographies. Nevertheless, those novel contributions from those gender and racial minorities were taken up by other scholars at lower rates, and the minority PhD awardees making those novel contributions were less likely to be hired into influential academic positions. The inescapable implication of the diversity innovation paradox is that science would be better, more broadly based, and likely faster and more efficient if we did not continue to squander the innovation that comes from those with different life experiences, who trained in different environments, and who may perceive and prioritize problems and their solutions from novel perspectives. Another group whose energy, insights, and creativity are undervalued is our early stage investigators. The rigid and formal academic hierarchy under which we train and work artificially empowers senior scientists. While the perspectives, opinions, hunches, and schemes from scientists with less experience are less frequently sought or considered, challenges and complexities and too often biases are further elevated for early career women scientists, especially those who are starting families. This is not to say that mentoring from senior scientists is unnecessary or should be discounted. We all need mentoring throughout our careers. However, we must um, more highly value fresh and bold thinking from brilliant, untarnished minds. Scientists from under-resourced countries or institutions also suffer serious inequities in access to essential materials, or even in the capacity to report their findings. We all know that publication of our work is an essential element of research because new knowledge and new technologies are dependent on, synthesized from, 
prior discoveries and developments, and in turn, serve as the foundation for future work. In that sense, publication is an essential part of the experiment, a part of the experiment. Not publishing is exactly the same as not doing the experiment. Are you, are you starting to get the impression, I think, that publishing is an important part of being a member of the STEM community? OK, well, it turns out that the process of publishing is fraught with inequities that disadvantage scientists who work in collaborative teams, who are traditionally marginalized, who have less power or influence, and who have fewer resources. Let's drill down on that last one, fewer resources, not necessarily because it is the most important, although it might be, but because it's readily quantifiable. Many of you know that the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy mandated that by the end of 2025, all federally funded research must be publicly available, openly accessible, without embargo. Now, obviously, there's a lot to like about immediate public access to STEM research. However, publishers of that research extract a fee from the researchers called the Article Processing Charge, APC, for that information in their journals to be openly available. Within a couple of months of the White House Directive, AAAS published data affirming and reinforcing the evidence. APC-driven open access mod models re require substantial resources that many researchers simply do not have creating financial career and, and career consequences for, for particular segments of the scientific enterprise. The AAAS sur survey found that a substantial majority of researchers had paid an APC and that for most of those, it was difficult or very difficult to obtain those funds, with most simply having to dip into parts of their research grant budgets that were designated specifically for buying the materials and supplies and instruments for executing exper their experiments in the first place. So that's right, to pay APCs to report work that the scientists had done, researchers had to defer purchasing materials needed for the work that they were doing. Most researchers tapped or exhausted funds designated for attendance at workshops or conferences such as this one, Women were much more likely than men to forego professional development opportunities. Women researchers and researchers in small and mid-sized institutions were much more likely than their counterparts at big major research centers to experience difficulties in finding funds for APCs. Providing the, in providing the pathway for open access publication, APCs disproportionately compromise the capacity of resource-limited STEM researchers to do research. So you see that the walls for entry and sustained membership in the STEM community are high and multifaceted. While these problems are daunting, it is encouraging, again, that there are some efforts beginning to recognize and address these longstanding barriers. AAAS last year launched multidisciplinary working groups, MWGs, which bring together diverse members across multiple career stages and STEM disciplines and sectors. The first MWG, Empowering Career Pathways in STEM, is tackling barriers to entering and staying in the STEM professional profession and being able to, to, uh, to uh, travel on journeys that contribute to the scientific community, practices that limit access to career opportunities or challenges, or challenges are taken up by this MWG. Negative consequences of unrealistic goals on career development are discussed, and skills required for various roles in STEM are considered. So this MWG, shared their draft recommendations during a focus group earlier today, here in Denver. And they are planning their next step, a series of webinars to acquire community input with final recommendations, likely to include calls to action at the individual office, 
department and institutional levels to be unveiled this spring. AAAS is currently seeking ideas for future MWGs, and I hope that one of them will explore how we effectively expand the diversity across and beyond the range I described here of who gets to participate. Why is that so important? Societal challenges across health, energy, food, and the environment are complex and do not apply evenly across populations. How STEM can successfully address these challenges will require teams that see the challenges from every angle. Scientists and engineers from underrepresented communities often perceive challenges that impact their communities differently from those from privileged communities. And they commonly tackle the same questions with completely different approaches. As basic research constantly reminds us, novel discoveries and impactful solutions often are hidden in the most unlikely places. Sometimes we discover possibilities by accident, or we may find inspiration when we are not tethered to one location or one way of thinking. When was the last time your mind was opened by a new wrinkle to a common concept? What new might we learn if the table where a research problem is pondered and decisions are made about strategy and approach was occupied by colleagues who reflect the rich flavors of this nation and beyond. What new and different might we accomplish if we opened our doors and surmounted the barriers that prevent us from broadening who can be at that table? Could that scaled up, scaled out STEM ecosystem we're imagining be drawn from the full range of this nation's backgrounds? education, experiences, and skills. That is essentially the goal of the SOA, the AAAS STEM Opportunity Alliance. AAAS is leading a national movement to ensure that by 2050, any child born anywhere in America considers it their birthright to become a scientist or engineer. They will know we value their contributions and we will celebrate their ingenuity and breakthrough thinking, which will enrich our society. That's hopeful. So at the end of uh, 22, the, uh, this SOA was launched at the first White House Summit on STEM equity and excellence. The Alliance hosted over the past year 12 convenings in venues across the country seeking advice to develop a strategy to achieve this vision. More than 1,500 individuals and community leaders participated, pointing to barriers that block access to the STEM workforce and suggesting solutions. They also pressure tested five pillars of a potential national strategy, and a draft of that strategy was recently released to invite um, uh, many public voices as possible into the process. So what happens next with the SOAs? This coming spring, the SOA will move to the action phase of their efforts. During a second summit, SOA will unveil its first national strategy and officially kick off the implementation of its plan. Importantly, success will require a cross-sector commitment that pulls in all segments of the STEM ecosystem. It will take all of us to make STEM opportunity, full access to STEM, truly universal. As a reminder of just how high and multifaceted are the walls that inhibit equitable membership in the STEM community, let me circle back to the inequitable, inequitable um, uh, impacts of APCs and tell you some encouraging things that are beginning to happen. The challenge here is substantial, is to identify business models for publishers that serve both readers and authors, that provide immediate open access to scientific uh, research outcomes and data, while at the same time ensuring an equitable ecosystem for scientists 
to publish their work. Two organizations I'm aware of, AAAS and the, and the Public Library of Science, PLOS, on whose board I also sit, have made commitments and launched experiments to identify workable approaches. The science family of journals, which AAAS publishes, offers progressively priced licenses whereby larger, more research-intensive institutions pay more. Five of the science journals enable immediate public access to all federally funded research through a, process, a policy called Green OA Zero Day, under which authors post without delay or added fees their fully peer-reviewed, revised, and accepted version in a public repository of their choice. PLOS was an open access publisher and open science advocate since its founding uh, around 2001 and is piloting three experimental non-APC business plans. I'll describe just one. It's a subset where a subset of PLOS journals is available for both readers and authors from a given institution under an institution-specific license whose institutional fee is determined by the average number of papers published in that uh, journal by authors from that institution over uh, the three most recent years with a rolling three-year average. Accordingly, institutions with numerous researchers active in the topical focus of that journal pay high fees, whereas institutions that are small, new, or relatively inactive in the topic area of the journal pay almost nothing. Ensuring immediate public access to the reported design and outcomes of STEM research will be a significant step in building public confidence and trust in science. That trust, as you all know, has significantly declined in recent years and was badly eroded during the global pandemic and the accompanying geopolitical turmoil. So that brings me to the final set of walls that I wanted to consider with you today. Those that separate STEM from the rest of society. Even casual self-assessment confirms that the STEM community has put relatively little effort into broadly communicating the nature and substance of our work, the crucial role of untargeted fundamental discovery as the foundation for innovative technologies that serve the public good, and the essential role of evidence in driving decisions, whether about interpreting the results of an experiment establishing a concept or hypothesis, or crafting public policy. In fact, it could be said that we STEM professionals have insulated ourselves from society, allowing our specialized expertise and nomenclature to convey an image that STEM people are Brahmins, wise and separate from, or even a cut above the rest of society. Of course, that stance is indefensible because we're not a cut above anyone. And especially at this time when breakthrough discoveries in science and technology, if wisely developed and equitably deployed in communication and collaboration with the public, could address urgent global challenges. So the good news is that while trust in science has declined in the United States, you may be surprised to learn that trust in scientists has not. I co-chair the Science and Technology Action Committee, which conducted research that found that nearly 80% of respondents across political affiliations are concerned about the politicization and distrust in science, and fully 80% wanted scientists to contribute more to shaping public policy. These findings suggest two things that we in the STEM community might do to seize this moment of sustained trust in scientists and combat the loss of trust in science. First, all scientists should receive training, probably during graduate school, in communicating with, not lecturing to, but communicating with the public. Being able to convey, for example, 
the role of basic knowledge discovery in advancing and developing new technologies, or illustrating in story form the iterative cycle of hypothesis testing, interpreting findings, and building on, on, a, building on a conclusion to frame a new hypothesis as a way to establish some understanding of how research advances can lead to changes in, for example, public health advice. Second, we must learn to truly engage, to listen respectfully and gain wisdom from the public, to understand the public context in which we work, and to secure crucial public feedback and advice. Virtually participation in the research and development process from the public. We're gonna need this if we are to secure advances that are accepted, effected, effective, and that truly serve all. As science and technology advances get more complex and begin to change the way we live and work, like artificial intelligence has begun to do, we will see increasing interest and concern from government representatives and consumers. The social and ethical impacts of these advancements must come to the forefront of the STEM community's collective consciousness. And with the advice of experimental, computational, and social scientists, ensure that they help and not harm. The National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine released a governance framework last year, which focuses on achieving equitable science and technology innovation in health and medicine. It recommends ways to align science and technology with principles of equity and how scientists and engineers can engage with and be advised by diverse communities at multiple stages along the technology development life cycle. I co-chaired that Academy's committee and one of the first things we learned was truly sobering. The committee looked at over 30 reports describing the development here in the US of new technologies of all sorts. We asked at what point during development was equity considered? And were different communities and individuals who might use the new technologies engaged and consulted? The answer, almost never. Looking at examples of cases where users were harmed, we learned that those harms were almost always disproportionately visited on underrepresented groups, lacking well-organized advocacies of their own, and most or all of the community outreach eventually undertaken was undertaken after harms had been uncovered and legal actions were in place. It's encouraging that in the US, a national science and technology plan is beginning to evolve, led by government with input from the National Academies Report and from the Science and Technology Action Committee, from academia, from the private sector, and with a strong assertion of the importance of robust public engagement. We may learn here from the European Union and the UK where the Horizon Program charged a commission of scientists, government, private enterprise, and public representatives to define missionaries for STEM focus. After extensive deliberations, five mission areas were agreed upon, climate change, cancer, healthy oceans, smart cities, and soil health and food. Scientists are pursuing these missions from basic discovery through innovative applications of those discoveries, supported both by public and private sectors and with concerned public engagement sustained. Finally, it bears mentioning that AAAS has developed numerous programs, actually far too many for me to even list here, but programs that strive for accurate public communication of sciences and to foster mutual trust between the STEM community and particular segments of the public, such as journalists, policymakers, and the legal and faith communities. So I'll just mention a couple here. Sciline 
is an independent editorial, it's editorially independent matching service for reporters and editors from general readership media outlets on deadline to connect directly with scientists in a given area of expertise, resulting in more accurate coverage. The AAAS Center for Scientific Evidence in Public Issues, or the EPI Center, this AAAS Science and Technology Fel Policy Fellowships Program, and the AAAS Office of Government Relations all provide expertise at the local, state, and federal levels to inform decision-making and policies. The AAAS Center for Science Diplomacy extends global outreach by leading and facilitating scientific engagements with countries around the world, especially where there are challenging geopolitical circumstances. The AAAS Center for Science, Scientific Responsibility and Justice is making efforts to improve scientific um, uh, uh, evidence in the courts while partnering with the epicenter to advise state and local governments as they increasingly adopt artificial intelligence in their operations and decisions about public goods and services. And the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, or DOSER, is engaging scientists and faith communities throughout seminar, through seminary programming, trainings, public events, and other resources. So these and many other AAAS programs are making a real impact and demonstrating what can happen when we develop sustained connections with public communities and key constituencies. These relationships earn us trust when issues do arise. And we all can be involved in these and other activities. To learn more about what you can do, um, visit the AAAS membership booth in the Expo Hall at, the, at this meeting, or attend the sessions that many of these teams are hosting throughout the course of this meeting. In concluding my remarks, I want to thank our donors, partners, and members. I have been overwhelmed by the support from this community whose generosity allows the AAAS to be a champion for the scientific enterprise and to lead with initiatives that have significant impacts on science and society. We are enormously grateful. In particular, I'd like to express my gratitude to the partners who are directly supporting this year's meeting that Gilda mentioned at the start of tonight's session and that you'll see and hear from throughout the meeting. I hope you're as excited as I am to explore the rich diversity of sessions during the meeting, which were created in the spirit of the meeting theme. For example, Dr. Monica Bertagnoli, the new director of the U.S. National Institutes of Health, is delivering remarks tomorrow at 1 o'clock about the health challenges facing the American people and the transformative potential of biomedical research followed by a Q&A session moderated by our CEO, Suda Parikh. We have a fascinating slate of topical lectures on space, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence, science policy, RNA, ecology, and reimagining the NIH through reauthorization. I think you'll be both inspired and intrigued by the sessions covering the 2023 Science Breakthrough of the Year winner and runners up. Tomorrow morning, we're celebrating, as Gilda said, seven AAAS awards in a special morning breakfast. This week, we announced the winners of the Philip Hogue Abelson Prize, the Newcomb Cleveland Prize, the David and Betty Hamburg Award for Science Diplomacy, and the Manny Balmick Award for Public Engagement with Sciences, the Early Career Award for Public Engagement with Science, the Lifetime Mentor Award, and the Award for Scientific Freedom and Responsibility. Gilda introduced those, those individual winners by name, but let's have another round of applause for these winners. <laughs> Across these remarkable awardees, I see examples 
of building trust with communities, embracing equity, breaking new ground. Each of these winners embodies what can happen when walls come down, collaboration thrives, and innovation takes center stage. Each of them has lived this ethos in their careers and in the relationships they form, in the bridges they build, in the advances they drive. So let me close by reminding you of one of the things I learned from Bruce Alberts early in my graduate training. We are blessed to work in a profession where we are empowered to define its standards and values, its relationship with the rest of the global community, its impact on the public good. I've talked about the problems, the walls, but also about the start that we have in recognizing and challenging them. We are in a position to make our exciting and important enterprise better. Who will make those changes? To answer that important question, I hearken back to the words of a former leader of our nation. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. So together, we can tear down these walls that separate us from each other, from bold thinking and doing, from joyful fellowship on a broader, more diverse and equitable and impactful workforce, and, for be and, from, becoming whole, and from becoming whole with our partners outside of STEM. Thank you. Thank you. So I now invite you to go back to a, what I think will be a really pleasant reception where we can meet with each other, intermingle, and, and uh, begin to plan our journey across into the rest of the meeting. Thank you all for coming, and we'll look forward to seeing more of you throughout the meeting.